before you can begin to lead, you have to serve and you, and you have to take care of people. You have to be compassionate and caring. And so I think that has always been part of my makeup. Welcome everybody to the Scott Ross Show. And I am really excited for you guys to get to hear from the guest that we have today. Her name is Becky Halstead, and she is an unbelievable leader. She's selfless. She's an entrepreneur. She's an author. She spent 27 years in the United States Army and really has a remarkable story. She was the first female uh, to ever graduate from West Point and then go on to become a general officer. She was the first female commanding general at a strategic level in Iraq. She led more than 20,000 soldiers and 5,000 civilians in Iraq and um, you know she's the first kid from her hometown little town in upstate New York to graduate from West Point so um, I think you're going to get a ton out of her story and I think there's lessons for all of us I mean there's lessons for those of us who are facing fears over big risks of doing something unconventional there's lessons for us in terms of tenacity and self-discipline and the will to keep going when things get hard. Um, there's lessons on how we should approach leadership, how we should empower others, um, how we can be a better listener. There's just a lot here in this interview, and I'm just really excited for you to hear it. So um, with that said, let's bring on our guest. So Becky, welcome to the Scott Ross Show. I'm so excited to have you and really grateful for someone with, uh, you know, your level of achievement to be speaking to our audience today. Well, thank you. It's humbling to be here with you, but I appreciate it. You bet. So for the people who aren't as familiar with you, maybe just tell us your background and your story real quickly. Sure. Well, um, so I grew up in a very uh, small town, a country town. Uh, I would say I'm a, just a country girl from a town with no traffic lights. And so... I, when I started out, I, I, all I do is play sports and go to school. And I thought growing up, I wanted to be a high school, uh, physical education teacher and, and go to college for that. And then one day my mom read about women being accepted into the military academies. Um, it was a very end of March and I got a letter from West Point saying, congratulations, we've accepted you into the class of 1981, which was the second class of women. So when that happened, I was scared to death. Like I can vividly remember reading the letter and not being able to feel my hands and my feet and my arms and my legs going, well, now what am I going to do? Right? So I knew I had to say yes, because so many people apply and so many kids want to go and to say, to say no, just seems like I'm, I'm uh, not being very obedient to, uh, to God and country. So and yeah, so I said yes, and I, off I went. A lot of my friends had big bets on how long I'd last, some not even a week. But uh, so I, off I went, and, and I, I learned very quickly that if I wanted to be successful and I wanted to stay, I better show a very strong dose of discipline. And, and so that I, I did that pretty fast. Um, when I graduated in 81, four years later, we have a five-year commitment. And I was quite certain I would only do five years. Um, I, would, I was committed to the commitment, right? But um, five years and I'm out. And then at the five year mark, I found myself, I was a company commander at Fort Lewis, Washington. And I really enjoyed being a leader. I enjoyed uh, training and working and serving with men and women in military. And so I thought, well, well let me stay a little longer to see what it feels like to be a major. Well, one, Thing led to another and I stayed 27 years and I'm very glad I did I have no regrets it was an incredible experience um, it, I, you know it's obviously it's a difficult experience and the culminating point for me was to serve in Iraq from 2005 to 2006 and during that time I was a commanding general for logistics in Iraq so a very large and complex organization and we had 20,000 military men and women and 5,000 civilians. So I did that, came back from Iraq, ended my career with uh, being chief of ordnance, which is the second largest branch in the army. So you're kind of like the dean of a college, responsible for all the leader training for, for those skill sets uh, on the enlisted and the officer side. And then uh, decided it was time to do something different. Retired, I, I mostly retired because I was ill um, I was struggling with chronic fibromyalgia and did not feel I could still give to my soldiers what they deserved in a leader. 
So the first year I pretty much focused on getting well. And then I started Steadfast Leadership. And in the last 10 years, I've been out speaking on leadership and taking those things, those stories and those leadership lessons learned from the military and translating that into the corporate sector. And I've had a lot of fun with that. So that's the shortest version I could give you. <laughs> that, terrific, terrific. Well, I, I, you know, in reading your information and just uh, starting to go through some of your material, actually, um, I just found a lot of kind of kindred connection to some of my passions around leadership. And I wanted to dive into that with you a little bit. One of the first things is, you know, you have your book, The First Person You Must Lead Is You, or 24-7, uh, The First Person You Must Lead Is You. And I am really passionate about this topic. So I want to talk to you about it because, you know, I do a leadership summit to kick off the year every year and, and oh. people come from all over the country for that. And I do a theme. I pick a theme every year. And uh, two years ago, the theme was leader lead thyself. And it just talked about the idea that the hardest person to lead is yourself. And I'm just curious, you know, A, why do you think it is that we have such a difficulty getting ourselves to do the thing that we know we should do? Um, you know, I always say there's like a veil and people have a version of themselves on the other side of the veil and they know if they could just get to that side of the veil where that other person is, they could accomplish everything, you know, but somehow they right. just can't get to that person. You know, maybe talk about what have you learned across your experience about why that is such a challenge for people? Well, I, I think to a degree, there's a, there, I think there's a few things. I don't think any one of them is hard and fast, but. I think one, people get tired. I, I can remember as a battalion commander, so as a battalion commander, you're a lieutenant colonel. So it was, uh, for me, it was 1997 to 99. So what I have, I had 16 years in the army. So that's quite a few years already. And I'm the battalion commander for a battalion. And I'm out running one day with my command sergeant major, who's like my right-hand man, right? And I was so mad because we'd had a kid go out and get a DWI and cause all kinds of trouble. And we're having to answer, you know, to the Colonel and the one star and the, the two star on post. And, and I'm like, you know, how many times do we have to tell them, right? If you're going to drink, don't drive. If you're going to drink, call us, we'll come pick you up. And my Sergeant major said to me, he says, ma'am, we, we can never stop telling them. We can never stop leading every day, ourselves and them. And the, and the minute you're tired of doing that, you, you're going to have to leave. And I thought, that's exactly, like, I was tired. I was just tired of having to do the basics still, right? Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and then the other piece to that was, he helped remind me that your team changes probably about every day. Somebody retires and moves to someplace else. Another person joins your team. So as a leader, you can't get tired of the basics for yourself and other people because your team's changing every day. And you, you know, like I know a lot of people, they go into a new job and they present themselves, right? Here are my priorities. Here's what I'm all about. Here's the handshake. And then they go, okay, I've done that. And they go like this and they kind of just, they, they forget well but tomorrow somebody new joined the team and they don't have a clue who you are as the as the leader or the boss or what you're so you have to keep dusting that off and bringing integrating every new people every new person onto your team so they understand that well we have to dust it off for a new person we better be dusting it off for ourselves so i think some people just get tired you know they kind of mm. get then i think other people think that like they've they've made it to a certain level and now, not that it doesn't apply to them, but that they can just kind of stop working so hard at it. Like they've earned the right to, to just relax a little. Mm. And, and I, you know, the old saying in the, in the military, as you know, rank has its privileges, right? I hated that. And I, I probably didn't hate it at first because I kind of wait, I couldn't wait to have rank so I'd have a privilege. But sure. then all of a sudden I woke up and I went, it should not be R-H-I-P, rank has its privileges. This should be rank has its responsibility. And in reality, the higher we go, the, the more we have to dig in. And I think the harder it should be, you know, because we are, we are more seasoned. We are tired. We are this or that. But it's the people that go like, no, hey, I got the privilege now. You know, Scott, you go take care of it, okay? Because, you know, I'm just going to sit here as the figurehead and have the title on my card and get the big paycheck and send other people out to do the dirty work, right? Right, and right. So I think it's some of those things for sure. 
And I, you know, there was, as you know, cause you've studied leadership and you, you spent a lot of time in this area. And we went through this, this time where it was all about empowerment and trust me, I love empowerment, right? I, I love to see somebody figure something out and, and execute and take action and see the results. That is all really good. But there, and there are many, many times that we as leader need, leaders need to be very indirect and we need to empower our people. But there are other times that we need to be very direct and make sure that we're very clear and we're very concise on what needs to be done. I mean, you kind of have to have a foot in both. But I do believe that some people get to the point where they go like, I don't have to be direct anymore. I don't have to be disciplined. I don't have to give consequences. Let me let other people do that. Right. Well, I mean, I no, I love it. And, and you know, I, I, I think about, you know, Paul has that famous thing where he says, you know, that which I wish to do, I don't do. And that which I wish I didn't do, I do. You know, I right. think it's just, it's the cry of the human heart. We all struggle with that a little bit. And, you know, one thing that stood out to me about your story that's in relation to this, or it seems to be anyway, is your nickname of the Energizer Bunny. You know, you're clearly <laughs> a high achieving person. You've done so many things and overcome a lot of obstacles and been a, a path set, a, a pace setter and a, you know, a pathfinder in so many ways. And so what is it do you think that's in you that you could maybe convey to someone else that allowed you to have that internal engine that just never stopped and was going to keep pushing forward to, you know, to accomplish such tremendous things? Well, I think some of it comes from just the strong sense of responsibility, right? And that comes from having a strong belief system, right? Mm. So, you know, um, I'm, I'm, I'm very, um, you know, vocal about the fact that faith is my foundation. It has been my whole life. I haven't always lived up to everything that I should, but but that's always been a strong foundation. And so I, I can remember, you know, going to West Point, um, I didn't want to let my grandparents down. I didn't want to let my parents down. I didn't want to let my, that little town with no traffic light down. So that helped me not to quit, right? So if you have a, a, a mental attitude of I'm not going to quit and I have determination and I'm, I'm going to, you know, ignore the critics and get through this, you know, ignore all the ones who, who keep pointing out the fact that maybe, you know, you're a woman and you don't belong here. Okay, whatever, that's their problem, not mine. So I think some of it has been, you know, just this strong belief system that um, God has the purpose for my life. And the sooner I figure out what that purpose is, which for me, I believe it was to serve others and to do that through leading and take care of people, it's very difficult um, to do that at low energy level, you know. <laughs> you yes. know yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah it, it, to me, leadership's about igniting in people the same passion and purpose or some passion and purpose, not to be the same, but, you know, they have to figure out what it is for themselves. I mean, think about an athlete, an athlete that figures out that they're great in gymnastics. It, you know, they have to have a lot of energy for that. That's what it a musician, whatever. Mine happens to be leadership and and just trying to serve others, help others, encourage others. Because the Energizer Bunny, I think of it is, you know, I like to be, I I I love it when people um, refer to me as the great encourager, right? Mm. Versus the great judgmenter, right? Mm. I mean, I'm not. I, I want to mentor, not tormentor people. So I I I don't I I don't know that I ever tell anybody directly exactly what to do especially personally because I, mean, I, I can't possibly know their whole life I can listen and I can take it all in and I can encourage and guide and provide some wisdom but major decisions that people make in their lives both personally and professionally I think are for them to make right now right. I I can certainly be very direct on a mission a professional mission but when it comes to you know how people will choose you as their mentor and they'll call and say, Hey, I got an opportunity to do this job. Should I do it? I'm like, okay, well, I'm, I'm happy to listen. We can talk about it, but you'll never hear me end the conversation with you better take that job or you're crazy. If you don't, you know, I'm just not going to do it. Hmm. I think I digress maybe a little on that one. Well, no, that's good. And you know, I want to get into your, your servant philosophy too in a moment, but I want to come back to this thing because you, you spoke about something there that I did want to dig into. And that is, 
I mean, I can't imagine the obstacles you overcame. I mean, you did, you were someone who was the first woman to do so many things. And I'm sure you must have run into lots of, you know, antiquated thinking and, and entrenched stereotypes and things of that nature. And one of the things that I know about a lot of the people I help coach and that I mentor is so much of the obstacles are wrapped in the opinions of other people. You know, other people's opinions tend to define them or create fear that they can't get over to take that next step. And so you've obviously been someone who's been able to get past that in a huge way. So how would you kind of coach some of those people? What would you say if they're listening right now around that idea of other people's opinions and the, the, the kind of hold it has on them psychologically? Right. Well, first of all, I think we should always operate from a, a perspective of we want to earn people's respect, but we also have to be very realistic that we're never going to earn everybody's respect. It's just not going to happen. And when it doesn't happen, I encourage people to not beat themselves up. If you've held to your character, your standards, your principles, then, and, and there's still a big wall there, then more than likely the wall has been created by the other person. Now you can, you can try to build a bridge and help them get over it. But you know, you, you, at some point you have to figure out not to invest your time and most importantly, your energy in trying to change someone who's not willing to change themselves. You know, the life's all about choices and they're making a choice. And the perfect example for me is, you know, it's just still unbelievable to me that there are old grads out there from West Point who are still just very, you know, still hate the decision to let women go into the military. Um, then maybe they accepted that a little bit, but boy, don't let women go infantry. There's no room for it. So, you know, I mean, I certainly have seen that perspective for a long, long time. Um, but I, but I, somewhere along the way, I had to make the decision that that's their problem and not mine, not to be rude because I would never be rude because any old grads got my respect because I know West Point was a lot harder for them than me. It's always harder for the people ahead of you, you know, because it just is. And um, so we both wear the same ring. We both graduated from the same institution. I have such great respect for that. Um, but if I can't earn their, res their respect, I really believe that that's their problem. And I, I've just got to move on to the people that there can be a respectful relationship with, because then we can do things together, right? We can, mm -hmm. but, I, but I will tell you this, sometimes, we also need to understand as individuals that we may be the one that's planting the seed to change that person. And then somebody else might realize the change later. I, I, I'm going through, because I, we're in quarantine or you know, in lockdown, uh, I'm going through 40 years of files and folders. You know, I have every mm. steno pad since I was a lieutenant and I, I'm, I'm almost embarrassed to say the things that I've saved. It's fairly organized, which is nice. So uh, yesterday I stumbled across a letter from a 57 grad and I, I forget where he met me. Uh, oh, I know I spoke uh, for Veterans Day at an Episcopal church in Pensacola. Mm. And so I was already retired. And this gentleman writes me a, a letter and says, and says, I've always been against women for the most part, having gone to the academy. But after meeting you and hearing you speak and just, you know, all that kind of whatever, he said, I am now convinced, I think we'd have been better off having women in the class of 57. Mm. Like that letter is almost as good as getting promoted, right? I mean, that's just, you know, that's a great feeling. And it's hard to share that humbly, but it's, I feel, I, I, and I feel good for him because he has missed out you know, on, on relationships and potential, uh, the p potential ability to help other people because he, he has this barrier. And, and I think that's why we got to be careful with our blinders on. A hundred percent. I love that story. So l if you'll permit me, let me just dig in a little deeper on the same thing. Okay. So, um, because I, I love what you're saying there about the fact that a, you're not going to win everybody, so you can't worry about that. And B, you're, you can plant the right seed and help, you know, have the process continue to evolve. Every one of us is kind of moving the ball forward a little bit. But there's a fear there too, right? Like, I, I don't know what you heard, but I'm, I, I'm going to make up things you might have heard that are pretty likely. Stuff like, you know, um, you know what, you're going to fail. You know, you're going to make a fool of yourself. Um, 
you know, a woman's place is somewhere else, you know, go to, you know, it would have been safe for you to be the PE teacher that you're a coach that you had thought about doing, right? <laughs> People would have accepted that, that you'd have fit in right away versus having to go through some rejection and, and, and risk, right? You're risking. What if you go to West Point and you fail? Now that's kind of embarrassing. You got to go home with your tail between your legs. So what does someone do when that other people's opinion is creating that fear mindset and the risk is really prominent in their mind to, to push through that and, and go after their dream, go after their goal? When you're going through the fear, uh, it seems like the worst fear you've ever had. Now, this isn't going to be comforting, but what I tell people is that the current fear is to prepare you for the future fear because it did right because there's always going to be more fear I'm, I'm unfortunately so when i think back as a cadet it, at first i mean they scared the living daylights out of me right yelling at me and spitting in my face and you're lower than whale whatever and you know, i'm gonna run your whatever out of this man's army and and then i was able to change internally and go wait a second they're not doing anything illegal they're not doing anything immoral they're just this is a game really to see how much I can take you know, tear you down and then build you back up. So accept that this is a game now. So once you realize that's somewhat of a game uh, to make you stronger and better, it's just easier to get through it. So you always have to keep perspective, I guess would be the way I would say it. So now once I was able to do that, now I'm still being yelled at, but now I can turn kind of tune out the ones that are being really ridiculous which by the way, they're the ones that yelled really loud, right? That's just, I mean, I was playing my prom song, you know, when they're doing that. The ones who would get up very close to me and I could feel their breath on my face and they would get very low and they would say, there's no room for you here and I'm going to run you out. Now they still incited fear for me, right? You know, just, but at any rate, so then I, so then I had to come up with the, another little deal with, cause I still have fear. And it was this, if I quit, because I really wanted to quit. Like I tell everybody, if you go back and look at my steno pads, every single day, there's an entry that says, I hate it here. I want to go home. You know, I miss my friends. I miss my dog. I miss my family. I hate it here. They're all, you know, having a great time. Right. Um, but I, at some point that first year, I realized if I quit, who wins? Mm. Not me. They win. Now that played in well for me, probably the rest of my career. But here's the deal. If I thought it was hard at West Point, it's way harder 20 some years down the road when you're now a, a, an accomplished officer uh, wearing general officer star and your three-star general tells you they have no confidence in your ability to command in combat. And I have a Harvard business case study on that. I mean, you know, it's one thing to hear that from some other, you know, some other uh, junior cadets that aren't even officers yet. You're all at college, but now when you have served your country for all these years and and had commands at all the levels, uh, I mean, you know, and just I, I was for me it was it was the most devastating part of my career, and it was happening after I already already had a full career. I mean, I could have retired, you know, what five years before that. So that was much harder to deal with than anything I dealt with as a cadet. And so immediately, you know, when he said that to me, the first thing I had to do, the first thing I did was actually question myself, which it's just because that, that I, the first person I'm going to look to is myself. You know, like, so I, I can remember thinking, is he right? Because if he's right, because I, my my position on leadership is it's an honor and it's a privilege especially in the military to lead america's sons and daughters especially to lead them into combat and this was all the train up in germany before we're getting ready to deploy and so i thought if he's right if the answer to that is yes then he must fire me because i would i would have lost the privilege and the honor to do that they deserve a leader that can take them into combat so then i had to step back and go well wait a second you know, he's not right. You know, I mean, he was just, uh, and, and again, we don't have to get into all that, but this was, this was kind of the way that he was dealing with all the leaders. Um, you know, and sometimes you have that, you have a toxic leader that deals, 
um, unfairly to everybody. And I can remember a two-star general putting his arm around me. That two-star general was later the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And he says to me, uh, Becky, he treats everybody that way. Well, that doesn't make me feel any better, right? So, um, so in some ways, in all ways, you can still get good out of that. There's still, there's, you can still become better because of those really harsh situations. Um, but uh, I, I had to really regroup, and I, I had to go. Wait a minute, no, this is, this is a, this is a person who's just on fire, and anybody in his path he wants to take out. Um, but regardless of that, I still work for him. And so I am going to have to weather it and I'm going to have to lead through it. And I'm going to have to figure out how much of a buffer I am to my own team and how do I internalize it, externalize it. And, you know, it was, it was really difficult, but what happens, you know, you stop and you go, my gosh, I would have never thought in a million years as a general officer with 20 some years in the military, that that would be like my worst day. Mm. Well, I love what you say. I mean, I, I, I'm taking notes myself. I mean, the, just the reflection of, are they right? Because I think that question does two things. I mean, as I hear it for myself is number one, it, it, it's, a, it's a humility. It's a humble approach to that experience instead of like having your dander get up and just wanting to fight. You know, it's more of a, okay, I'm going to humble myself and really ask the question. Um, but the thing it does too, is it, it kind of reinvigorates me when I think about it, because when i given it more of a, a, a cerebral approach rather than an emotional approach to say, is that true? Okay, no, it's not true. Um, I can do this. I can accomplish whatever. It's almost like you reinvest. It's like you double down and you're even more invigorated to go after the goal uh, when you take that approach. So yeah, I think that's terrific. I, I love that. Um, yeah, you're, well, and, you, and, you know, and you know you can't do it alone. So that, that's the other piece, right? You have to... Uh, you go, okay, I'm in this situation. Who do I share it with? Who do I not share it with? Because you and I both know we have people that will work for us that are so loyal that they can't take that kind of news. Like, mm -hmm. you know, kind of like a parent, right? Uh, if, uh, if, 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 as a parent, if you correct your child harshly, that's okay. But if somebody else comes in and corrects your child harshly, that's, those are fighting words. So you had to be careful what you say to who because you don't want you don't want someone going in your defense and then really getting into trouble mm -hmm. uh and so you have to know which leaders you can confide in and i i, I chose about a half a dozen people of different ranks that i kind of considered my um internal board of directors and and i just knew that because I, I knew i had to talk about it if i only internalize it I'm going to flatline. So, you know, you have to, you do have to work through it. You can't just say, okay, well, they're wrong and I'm right. And I'll just suck it up. You know, uh, you might try that, but it probably won't work out. No, absolutely not. I mean, you know, John Maxwell's 11th law of the 21 irrefutable laws of, of leadership is the law of the inner circle, which says that those closest to you will determine your potential. So I 100% echo what you're saying there. So let's turn now to this philosophy that you have of servant leadership and the steadfast leadership system, again, really resonates with me. I just believe very much in the approach of the leader being the chief servant, if you will. So tell me a little bit, just give me, I guess, the, the 30 second commercial for the steadfast system and kind of servant leadership in general. Okay, so again, um... Well, steadfast, actually, the steadfast leadership philosophy for me actually started uh, back when I was a lieutenant colonel in the Army. So um, I was sitting down to write my leadership philosophy as a new battalion commander. I wanted to be able to give that out to all the people who worked for me my first day in command. And so I was sitting at my desk, and I'm like, okay, Becky, no kidding. You now have to figure out what, what was most important to you, right? So I thought, okay, well, let me just write out some values and principles that are most important to me. And I was just trying to do one word, right? Like uh, discipline, that's an easy one, right? So I, I wrote out all these words. I probably had, I don't know, 10 to 15 wor words of which every single, and I want to make an acronym, right? 
So, cause you get more out of it that way. So I look at all these words and every single one of them started with a consonant. So I was like, wow, I can't, I can't, I can't do that because I need some vowels, right? You know, Vanna, I'd like to buy a vowel. So, uh, so at any rate, so, um, so as I looked at these values that are important to me, these principles are important to me. I kind of moved them around on the paper and I thought, well, another word for that is excellence. And another word for that is attitude. So I started to get my vowels in there. I kind of sat back in my chair and I'm looking at my office. My parents had just helped me put all my I love you stuff on the wall in my new battalion commander's office. And I looked up on the wall, which happens to be in this office too. And many years ago, my mother gave me uh, a print. And you're probably familiar with this where it's your name. And then there's a Bible verse that goes with the name. And so it was Rebecca and it said underneath it, faithful and steadfast. And it's 1 Corinthians 15:58. So I saw the word steadfast and I thought steadfast and I looked at it and going back and forth. Right. And so I thought, that's it. Steadfast. I love it. And, and so I went, okay, soldiers, training, excellence, attitude, discipline, family, uh, accountability, safety, teamwork. That's it. That's going to be it. And so that's when it started and it kind of took on a life of its own. People would say, Hey, can I use that too? And I'm like, sure you can use it. I mean, anybody that wants it can use it. But I felt like my soldiers could easily remember the word steadfast and the nine things that it stood for. And those nine things are what were very important to me as a leader that I wanted to also pass on to them to be important to them. If it's important to all of us, then our unit, our organization can move forward that way. And then when I retired, because I'd been using that since 1997. And like I said, it took on a life of its own. I thought, all right, I'm going to keep steadfast and I'm going to call my one person company uh, steadfast leadership. And the only thing I did was I changed a few of the words to, you know, just to, uh, it's like selfless service. I didn't have to do selfless service in my steadfast acronym because the army uh, general Reimer, when he was chief staff of the army, he came up with the word leadership. And he made that an acronym and selfless service was already part of it. So I could kind of cheat with steadfast because a lot of other ones are in the leadership. But when I, when I retired, I changed uh, steadfast. So it'd be more, even more aligned to me as a person. And then also that I could share with the corporate uh, and civilian sector. So selfless service service became in that. And then just growing up in the, you know, in a, in a very, uh, uh, far, a farming community, uh, you know, going to church five times a week, everything was about serving others, you know, that before you can begin to lead, you have to serve and you, and you have to take care of people. You have to be compassionate and caring. And so I think that has always been part of my makeup. Um, but so I just, that's been very important to me. And I, that's what I've clung to all these years. Well, I, I, I commend you for it. And, you know, I think when most people um, who haven't really given a lot of thought to leadership, when they think of being the, the leader, the, it's kind of like what you said earlier in the, in the interview when you're talking about rank has its privileges. Those are the things that they're looking forward to. You know, they're thinking, man, when I get to sit on the throne or, you know, when I get to have the big office or, you know, people will come and serve me. People will do what I want. I'll be able to kind of give my bidding. That's kind of what's in the, the mind of the novice who's not really thought deeply about leadership. So why does, why does serving, why does flipping it on its head, why is that effective? Like, what have you seen in terms of getting results? Because a lot of people think, well, when I'm in charge, I'll be able to get results because I'll make things happen my way. And what we mm -hmm. find out, I think, very quickly is, Mm, that's probably a formula for disaster. So, right. you know, talk about how it's kind of counterintuitive that if you serve, you, you do get your, the better result. Right. Well, because it kind of goes back to that whole concept of empowerment. When you serve, you are, you are um, helping to provide tools to other people so that when you're not there, they can, they can be successful. Right. And so if we're able to, define our success by how we make other people successful, define our leadership by how we have served others, then I think we make a stronger team. You know, see the old saying about, right, I mean, I, about the, uh, you know, I can, uh, what's the one about the fish, right? You teach someone to fish or you can give them a fish or teach them to fish and you know, then it, you, you got it. Um, so, 
so for me, for instance, in Iraq, I'll give you a story that to me kind of plays this out. So I'm the commanding general of, of logistics in Iraq, and I, I know that I want to do some things differently in terms of our, our road network and our critical path method of delivering logistics. And, you know, and I, you know, I, I got an engineering degree. I've been doing logistics for a long, long time. I could probably have sat in my chair and said, okay, here's what we're going to do. Do, 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 do. And, 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 and just give out orders and say, now go make that happen. Or, I could bring in the people that are actually doing the work, listen to them and take the best of the ideas around the table. Um, and, and so I chose the latter, right? I chose the latter because when, when you bring those that you lead into the equation of success, right? Into the, into the formula. They, so initially now sitting around the table, my very first meeting of, of we're gonna take one problem and we're gonna come up with a better solution on how to, to, to do this activity. The very first one I chose what I was, I wanna minimize empty vehicles on the road networks. Because think about it, we're doing logistics. So somebody's going from base A to base B, they dump off their supplies and then they go back empty. And so empty vehicles are passing each other out on the road network. And, and I, I just happened to hear two soldiers eating lunch one day going, you know, isn't that amazing? I'm driving an empty vehicle, you're driving an empty vehicle. What if we hit an IED at the same time and, and we die driving empty vehicles? I'm like, that would be horrible, right? But I hadn't really thought about, about it. So went well, back to my staff, I said, let's do a critical path method. I want some ideas here. That was okay for the science, but I needed the art of it, which is the people actually doing the job, right? Because, because it's, you can't just say the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. You can, but that doesn't mean it's the most effective anymore, not in combat. So anyhow, so I said, I want to have this meeting and that's the first thing I want to address, minimize empty vehicles on the road network. So I come into the meeting and everybody around the table is a colonel. And I say, hey, this meeting's over. And they're like, what do you mean it's over, man? We haven't even started. I said, how many of you drive a truck? How many of you load a truck? How many of you do the intelligence preparation of the battlefield? How many of you, you know, do the safety briefing? How many of you are a convoy commander? None of you, you're colonels, you're staff officers. Yes, you have a lot of experience, but you're not out there right now where the rubber hits the road. I want a young private that's driving the vehicle. I want a lieutenant that's a convoy commander. I want a warrant officer that's, you know, doing the, the, the safety issue and all that. And the guys that are, gals that are loading the vehicles. So we brought them all up. We did the meeting over. Now, do you think a private really wants to talk to a general and come up with good ideas? Not at first, right? I mean, they just don't. They're like got their hands, they're sitting on their hands going, I hope she doesn't ask me a question. But by the end of that hour, you almost couldn't, could not turn them off. Because now they, they really realize, and, and I do think this is servant leadership. They realize that I'm listening. Now, it's like a parent. You listen. It doesn't mean your kids have all the great ideas. They might have some great ideas, but not all great ideas. So I listen, I discern, and then I make some decisions of what we're gonna do differently based on their input. And the beauty of that was they, they realized that their voice was heard, that we're gonna make some changes. And when they walk out the door, the beauty of it is they own it. Cause they, they, that was their idea, they own it, they gotta execute it. And so that, when we, earlier we're talking about energy, right? The energy with which they left the room was much greater than the energy that they came into the room. And they went back and they go, that now they want to come up and talk to the general on another problem because they got some good ideas. So they become your real eyes and ears and they're your doers. Um, and now they trust me even more, I think, to make the right decisions for them. Mm, love it. So, I, I mean, what I see you doing there is you are delivering a message in a not really super subtle way that they are, that you consider them as invested in the result as you are and that it's really their result and that you're, you care about them. I mean, I had a, I had a, a, a guy I worked for named Colonel Mark Ewing in the um, 201st MI Brigade back uh, when I was in the military. And uh, one of the things that always stood out to me was that he was, he had been an enlisted man in Vietnam. And he had gone back after Vietnam, become a commissioned officer, and then went up through the ranks that way. 
And it was always remarkable to me how he did exactly what you're saying. He was super concerned with the boots on the ground and exactly what was going on there and how their input would make a difference. So I learned that lesson very, very early on in kind of my leadership development, just seeing him model that. So let me just ask you a couple quick last questions. One, I heard that you had Joshua 1.9 on your dog tag. So I was just curious right. if you want to, what, what, what was, what's the meaning of that verse to you and why, why did you put it on such a cherished thing as your dog tags? Sure. So, um, well, we, we on, on my dog tags is also the warrior ethos. So the, the military said, this is, you know, uh, very important. And, um, and so that's, that was great. I, the reason why Joshua 1.9 is because it says, be strong and courageous. Don't be terrified. Uh, don't be discouraged. Uh, God's with you wherever you go. And, you know, and I had never been in combat when I went into combat and I certainly had never led at the general officer level, 20,000 men and women. Um, and so what I did know is uh, that I have layers of leaders with lots of experience and, and expertise and we're in this together. But I love the idea of knowing that no matter where I was on the battlefield, where I was in making a decision, uh, that God was gonna be with me. Um, and so it was just really comforting. Um, and a lot of people asked me, well, was I ever scared, you know, in combat? And cause that ver but cause that verse says, do not be terrified. And I said, candidly, I don't recall ever being scared. And, you know, and our base was attacked and, you know, we did some very interesting things in the air and helicopters and C-12s and whatever and ground convoys. But I don't remember ever being uh, terrified. The thing on that verse that was the hardest for me were, is where it says, and do not be discouraged. Because that's what I fought the most. When we're over there serving our country and trying to help uh, another country with their democracy and et cetera, et cetera. And then you have to deal with people cheating on their spouses, right? Then you have to deal with or a, a soldier on soldier attack uh, or stealing, right? Uh, the black market with the fuel. So I'm going like, Really? I mean, you know, so you have such a purposeful career and mission, and yet we have this kind of, you know, we're not supposed to drink alcohol, yet somebody gets, you know, a brother-in-law to mail them a bunch of booze, and then a bunch of them get in trouble drinking it. Like, why can't we just be obedient, right? And so what I discovered was, like, that discouraged me. Or uh, if I made a decision that I felt wasn't the best decision or it was a little late or I didn't respond exactly the way I should. So that's what I fought the most. And so that dog tag helped keep me grounded to don't be discouraged, just do something about it, right? You know, deal with it. Because I know for a fact that, you know, a lot of people go, they kind of look the other way, especially on things like uh, cheating on the spouse look, we're over here for a, a year, I get it. No, we're over for, here for a year and I don't get it, you know? Uh, I can remember having all 800 people of my staff all stand up together, all every single one of them that was married or was in a committed relationship and raise their hand and commit themselves to being uh, honest and true to that relationship and then told them to sit down. I said, there's gonna be casualties on the battlefield, but nobody's, nobody's relationship should be a casualty because you just not have enough discipline to, you know, stick with it. So, um, so yeah, so I, 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 and I still, you know, I still carry my, it's called my shield of faith and that's the verse on it. Mm, I love it. So I asked uh, my guests, every one of them, I asked them if you had to recommend only one book to people to read, what book would you recommend? Well, it's kind of funny because you mentioned John Maxwell and, you know, he signed, he, uh, he was kind enough to do a, 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 like a testimonial on the back of my book. Um, and I love every one of his, but because it's so hard for me to choose, my answer when people ask me that is always the Bible. And candidly, John Maxwell's leadership Bible. So he he has a, you know, a Bible where he, all in the margins and underneath, you know, he takes the verses and he, and he, he pulls out character and he pulls out all these leadership values. And so that's like always been my absolute favorite Bible is the John Maxwell 
uh, leadership Bible. But to me, the principles in the Bible are enduring. And if, uh, if you know, that they, they've been wonderful for me to follow and practice and share. So that's, that's my final answer. I love it. I mean, you couldn't do better than that, I don't think. So listen, uh, Becky, it's been a real honor to have you on the Scott Ross Show. And I know that our listeners got a ton out of it. Where can people get more information and connect with you on another level? Uh, mine's really easy. It's www.beckypalstead.com. So um, it's the only one out there. And there's a little contact Becky on there. And sometimes a lot of people will send me emails. Um, there's videos, that sort of thing. But quite often people just send an email. It just says, you know, they have a question or they listened. And I always enjoy those. I try to answer all of them. Some do go to spam, but I try to answer all of them. Terrific. Well, we'll have that link in the show notes for the show and uh, we'll uh, send people your way. Thank you so much for your uh, kindness and your generosity with your time. And I wish you the best. Thanks for having me. It's been, I, I mean, I, these things really stimulate you, right? They give you more energy. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Thanks, Scott.